Hello, welcome to Sacred Blossom Farm. I'm Tony DiMaggio. Last year, 2018, was my third season on this farm. I grew, dried, blended, processed, and packaged 1,500 pounds of herbal teas for my Sacred Blossom herbal tea line. Let's take a little farm tour. I'll show you how I do it. I started farming, apprenticing under a man named Paul Lawton. His passion and his main interest was soil health, human health, and where those two things come together. After working for Paul for six years and being his right-hand man, um, I knew I couldn't make a livelihood growing vegetables and fruits like we were doing it. So I set out on a tour for two years and I visited as many different wide variety of farms as I could. So I went and got a job on one of the largest diversified organic herb farms in the country. I started looking closely at what herbal products were in the marketplace. I started looking at the herbal teas and the quality of the herbs that went into the herbal teas. And I thought, wow, I can do a much better job than that. So on my farm, I really try to mimic natural systems. Um, I have my plants very tightly spaced, minimum fertilizer, minimum irrigation, and all the different varieties of plants mixed together. The plants struggle more and they do grow more slowly, but that's the point. It makes them more medicinally potent. My pest control system is all about biodiversity. There's so many different living plants and there's so many different pest predators that I don't think I'll ever have a problem. This is cup plant. If you see here, it has dew that's collected in these leaves every morning all the way through middle of the day. This year I planted over a hundred of these around the farm. It's a symbolic gesture to the birds and insects and amphibians. I have four different varieties of peppermint that I grow. This chocolate mint, this is the main variety I'm propagating now. I like its growth habit and it's has the most pleasing aroma. I have five varieties of spearmint. The variety I've settled on now is called Scotchmint, which I was given by Jane from Four Elements Farm. And she's been growing herbs for longer than I've been alive. So like when she shares something with me, I'm all ears. Um, and she goes, this is the best variety of spearmint. And I took a little taste of a leaf and I go, yes, no doubt. So typical spacing for peppermint might be one foot between plants and three feet between rows or two feet between rows. But I'm not mechanized. Every inch of land I cultivate by hand. I hoe and weed by hand, which means I want to have as few inches of land as possible. So I planted the chocolate mint every other row and then California poppy between that. And now the chocolate mint's really filling in and we're August 7th now and any day we'll come through and pull up the California poppies and the chocolate mint will be able to fill in the rest of that field. So this peppermint, this chocolate mint, might be 60% as strong as I'd like to see it before we harvest. When I break this plant and smell, I want it to be so potent that it really burns the nostrils. One of the best questions I get is, when is it the right time to harvest herbs? And you have to start with understanding where the plant has its energy. For root crops, you want to wait until the plant is gone dormant and it's put all its energy from the leaves back down into the soil. With this California poppy, it's a progressively flowering plant, but right now it's accumulating energy and it's just starting to put out a little bit of seed. As the plant gets bigger, it'll start making more of its energy from the plant into the seed, and we want to harvest it while the energy's still in the physical part of the plant. With your aromatic herbs, you want to get them when the energy is going up into the plant and into the flowers. A lot of the hippies will say, oh, you have to do it with the moon. When the moon's full or just fast full, that's when your aromatics are gonna be at their most potent. If you ask the scientists in the lab coats, they'll say, oh, you wanna wait till they're like 20% into flowering. That's when they're gonna be most potent. What I do is the only thing I think makes sense is I go out and I smell everything. And all the time I'll load up gloves and knives and bins into the truck and go out to harvest. And before I start, I'll smell everything. I'll you know, it's not really at 100% today. We'll wait. We'll wait a couple days, see if it changes. Um, and one thing I've been really surprised about is how often my nose coincides with the full moon and coincides with flowering. When are these going to be ready to go? Uh, in 10 days, right after the full moon is my bet. Also, moisture, uh, weather, clouds. Um, after a sunny day, the next day, your stuff will be mo more potent. After a lot of rain, you'll have more growth, but less potency. So there's a lot of conditions that come to play, and that's why I like to rely on my nose. And I really know I'm harvesting at the best possible time. I also know when it's time to harvest the plant 
when it's covered in bees. I have maybe 4,000 Tulsi plants this year. And when I start harvesting, there'll be a, you know, a bee on every foot or every two feet a row. By the time I get to the end of my 4,000 plants and I've harvested almost everything, all those bees consolidate on just the last plant. So I'll be finishing, I'll be in, there'll be 50 bees on each plant. It's really special. This is Tulsi. Tulsi is one of the most important herbs in Ayurvedic medicine. It's good for like a calm, grounded energy. It's like as different from coffee as you could possibly get. In some places and with some people in India, it's so sacred that you can't even consume it. It's just for like planting around temples and things like that. One of the big problems I have is quack grass, perennial grasses with the rhizominous growth. It's very hard to keep those out of the field. So around the whole field of chocolate mint, there's a border um, about five feet wide of annuals, Tulsi lemongrass. And when the grasses all summer long, they're gonna try to creep in from the outside. Then at the end of the year, I can just till the annuals in and the perennials will be grass free in the middle of the field. This is anise hyssop. It's a plant that everyone should grow in their garden. It's a native prairie plant and does very well here. You can see it grows pretty tall. It gets above the weeds. It's also in bloom almost all summer long. Um, tracks pollinators. It smells delicious and it tastes quite nice. I love the native prairie plants. I love the plants that naturally do well here. That's a big bumblebee, huh? It is a big bumblebee. Yeah, so this is the wild bergamot. You can tell by the color of the flowers. Um, by going through and cutting by hand, I can make sure that I cut only the best parts of every plant, and that's all that ends up into the tea. With these, everyone else is just cutting like all the green matter. What I'm gonna do with these is just pop off the individual flowers, and those are what's gonna go into the tea cup. In the very front of the field, I like to not harvest the plants uh, so I can save those for seed. Um, and then when we were going through harvesting, you'll see a few plants in there that didn't get harvested. And I was going through harvesting and you know, you pay attention to every plant you do. And this one smells extra. So those ones I left um, and hopefully the seed from those will be just a little bit better. This is Shisu. It's a Japanese culinary herb, um, very potently flavored. So I don't need very much. Shisu. This is just a little wild area here. Um, you know, I wanted to leave a little space with just wild habitat. You know, it's uh, good for the bugs and good for everything else. So I've got those scattered around the farm. I don't need to use every inch of land out here. It's a 60 acre farm. So you saw that other field with the California poppy and the peppermint. This is the same exact treatment, but with spearmint. And we went in here yesterday and we harvested the California poppy and we weeded. And if you look, it's just like perfectly clean field now. Most herb farmers are gonna mulch um, to keep weeds down and improve the soil and all that. But mulch is on this scale, is, it's difficult to do. It's hard to buy in that much hay for a reasonable price. It's hard to get organic hay. Most of the times the hay you get is filled with weed seeds. And then it's very time consuming to put the hay out. Then in the spring, you have to rake the hay off um, so it's not drowning your plants. It's a lot of work. I've been using large round bales and small squares of spoiled grass hay for mulch. The single biggest problem I've had with mulching is how long it takes for the ground to warm up in the spring. And then I've also had problems with nitrogen deficiency caused by the mulch decomposing. What we did here, we broadcast oats peas and radish seed. Then we harvested the California poppy and weeded at the same time. Just took two guys like three hours to do this field. Got a really great harvest of California poppy. And then when we're weeding and we're pulling everything up, we're trampling in the cover crop seed we put in. We're putting dirt over the cover crop seed by ripping up weeds. And the oats, the peas, and the radishes are going to germinate soon. We've had great weather for it. They'll come up a little bit. In a couple weeks, we're gonna harvest the spearmint, and then a whole new round of light's gonna to get to the ground. The oats, peas, and the radishes are really gonna take off by this fall. Um, the oats and the peas and the radishes will actually overshadow the spearmint. That's okay, this is a first year planting. I'm only trying to get one harvest out of it. So the oats, peas, and the radishes will cover the ground, and that will be my mulch. 
So a lot less labor intensive than going out there with hay. Also the seeds are cheap or the hay is much more expensive. And you're getting the organic matter with the roots of the plants that die deep down into the soil. So stacking functions, we're in there harvesting and weeding. And before that we direct seeded. Starting all my plants in the spring might be one of my favorite processes on the farm. It's really critical that you have really good germination and almost every cell has a plant in it. I'm very careful to put the same exact amount of soil in each one of the cells and put the plants at the same depth across every tray. That helps with making sure every seed comes up and is at the same exact height and each cell has the same amount of soil and it keeps irrigation and watering on these small cells very even. You have to remember the whole world of the plant is just that itty bitty cell. So if there's half as much soil or the plant's twice as big, it has different water requirements, but it's impossible to water each cell differently. In the spring, the number one killer of small plants is overwatering, so you have to be very careful for that. I save most of my own seed. It saves a lot of money and it's also really enjoyable. I'm also working on improving the seeds that I have so the genetics are better each year. A lot of these wild herb seeds don't germinate nearly so well as vegetables, so it's really important to have ideal conditions. I water everything in totally equal amounts and then I cover everything with saran wrap and put it under grow lights, checking the temperature often with a thermometer. This makes sure that every plant is at exactly the right ideal temperature for germination. Also, heating a greenhouse in the spring here in March can be very expensive. So the grow lights are a more energy efficient way of getting the plant started that early in the year. For basically every plant I do, I want exactly one plant per cell. So generally I'll put one or more seeds in each cell and then I'll have to go through and thin out to make sure there's just one plant in each spot. It's kind of labor intensive, but I love this work in the spring. Then I have this custom built herb chariot, which I can fit about 16 flats of plants on and transport them over to the greenhouse. I also use the same chariot to bring plants out into the field when it's time to transplant. This hoop house I actually got out of entirely recycled materials. A neighbor built it for me on trade. I did 40,000 transplants this spring, so my tiny hoop house and all this area, all these pallets were just covered with flats of plants. And this year I learned about how great black currant leaf tea can be. Everyone grows black currants for the berries, but I'm gonna grow them for the leaves. My herb mentor, he strongly believes that plants grown from seed have a far superior form than plants grown from cuttings. So like I said, I've done three plus acres of black currants, but always from cuttings. So I'm doing some black currants from seed this year just to see how the nature and the form of the plant varies from plants taken from cuttings. I don't think there's gonna be much difference, but I'm really anxious to find out, it'll be interesting. So weeding is the most labor intensive part of any small scale diversified farm like this. I don't have those cultivating tractors just yet, but I've got really great hand tools. Um, after we plant, I use this guy two or three times as a torsion weeder. If you look how gentle that is, it can only kill like itty bitty fine weeds and works particularly well in my sandy soil. Um, but I just walk along with this thing. <laughs> Walking speed, um, it does a very good job to not damage my plants and uh, does a pretty good job. After the weeds get a little bigger though, like that just doesn't really do anything. So um, I use this guy as a two wheel hoe and I can go right over the tops of the plants with this. But what I lack for in speed, I'm kind of make up for in like really precision because I'm there handling it and I'm making sure it's like just perfect at every step. So this is the steel tiller, little tiny tiller. Uh, it comes with a three year warranty. They didn't know what I was gonna do with it. <laughs> um, and I go and walk between, once my plants are bigger, it throws up some soil, it's kind of aggressive. It throws up some soil onto my plants. I do it when my plants are already a little bigger. And that soil creates a little mulch. It's dry, sandy soil that isn't compacted. Seeds won't germinate in there till the next rain. Um, and it'll bury any little baby weeds that are under that. But my plants are generally up big enough that I can throw a little soil onto it. And I go, just walking as fast as I care to walk with that thing and um, I'm not sure how many miles of row I have on the you know three acres of intensive herbs I've got um, just a lot last resort is the hoe I uh, am like the world expert with the hoe I got my 10,000 hours in. I keep this thing razor sharp I go through like six files a year 
Um, and mostly what I'm doing is surgery, just, um, just very gently cutting things out. Every once in a while, like, especially we're coming into like July, August, it's a little more aggressive hoeing. The weeds have gotten a little bigger. And then just now, finally, this time of year, I start to do a little bit of hand weeding. Um, I, lots of times I'll hand weed during my first harvest of crops. And then after that, the plant, the crops are shading the ground and you're not gonna see weeds again. One of my trick moves is sometimes I'll use a knife and when things are getting ready to go to seed, I'll just cut them and they'll kill the plant and get it before it's gonna be viable seed. And that's like the way to maximize the organic matter that that weed's putting in. That weed was putting down shade, preventing other things from growing. Um, and to go in there just one time and touch that big plant with a knife and psh, doesn't take that long, um, especially if you've already killed 99.9% .9 of your weeds when they're that big. The giant herb farm I was working on in Oregon spent thousands, I'm not sure how many thousands of dollars a year on propane, like six, seven thousand dollars a year. And you're just literally just burning your money, right? Especially there where it's hot and dry all the time. Um, I don't want to spend any more money on burning fossil fuels than I have to. So I inherited all these buildings. I painted the roof of the shop black. It's a 35 by 35 square feet, collects a ton of sunlight, and I pump that through with a fan into a yard of 10, a bed of 10 yards of washed rock. And it helps heat up during the day and it equalizes the temperature so it doesn't get too hot and then it maintains that heat during the night fairly well. For my little farm, I built what I believe is the largest herb dryer for diversified herb production in the Midwest. I have a thousand plus square feet of drying space and that allows me to be patient. Instead of harvesting herbs every day, I can wait till the herbs are at their peak potency and also dry them at lower temperatures as well. The setup I have in the herb dryer is designed for highest quality. There are different setups you can have that are better for like larger scale, but what I do is I put all the herbs spaced out on these trays so that way everything dries very evenly. If a herb gets too dry, it's in the dryer for too long, it'll lose a lot of its uh, constituents. So I spread everything out nice and evenly, and then everything dries evenly, and parts of the batch aren't way too dry while other parts aren't dry enough. These are California poppies that we harvested yesterday. Um, California poppy is the most potent plant that I grow, and it's one of my favorite plants to grow. Um, it's totally non-addictive, totally non-narcotic, totally legal, but you drink a cup of California poppy tea, and like you know about it. Would you pass a drug pass? Yes. The poppy seed from bagels, your poppy seeds that you cook with, are from the same plant that your opium's from. Um, this is a quite different plant. This does not have the morphine compounds in it. It has other alkaloids. Californine is one of them. What I've looked at pretty extensively is, yes, you would pass. So most everything I do doesn't get washed. It's dry processing. One of the the, the real risk in like is bacterial contamination, right? And water, uh, bacteria thrives in like moist environments. So what I don't want to do is like wash the leaves of my plants and then pile them in here in like 95 degrees bacteria paradise. This machine here is uh, designed by, and by me and one of my Amish neighbors and he welded it together. And it's a little motor, shakes this table back and forth. I have some different size screens and um, the idea is a lot of herb farms, they take the whole plant, cut it with a big mower, dry it, shove it through a hammer mill. That's what you're buying. Um, but stems for the most part aren't very good. So I use this machine to shake out all the stems. I push all the leaves through, the leaves break, the stems stay on top and I'll frequently put things. There's two sets of screens over it three times. So stuff will get screened six times to really get out any stems, anything other than like the prime herb material. And also we cut everything by hand. So everything that comes in here is like a perfect leaf. You know, we know everything that comes in and then we're handling everything in here repeatedly. So if we do find a blade of grass or a brown leaf, those things all get picked out one at a time. And that's how we ensure that everything goes in the tea is perfect. So I break farmers into two groups, farms that weed by hand and farms that don't. Weeding by hand immediately limits your scale so much. So I'm trying to learn to grow some different crops without any weeding at all. There's many sections of this farm where I throw down native wildflower seeds. This year I ran five or six different trials trying to grow California poppy without any weeding. Last winter I went out to one of the large California poppy reserves 
and saw how the plant grow and grows in its native habitat. So I'm trying to mimic that here, this field and this field and three fields over there are different treatments trying to grow poppies without any weeding. We have very cold, harsh winters here. A lot of the herbs I grow are marginally winter hardy. Um, lemon balm, sage are two marginally winter hardy herbs that I grow. I try to keep things that might not survive the winter together, together, so that we have blocks that are less of a problem. It was really cold and there was no snow on the ground and then winter lasted a long time and there was a lot of snow on the ground. It was just a really hard year for plants to overwinter. In the spring, I didn't see my lemon balm and my sage coming up, but I didn't. I wanted to wait and just really make sure. And by the time I was 200% convinced that they were gone, the weeds were already coming up. At that point, I could have tilled the field and put in cover crop, but I already had a cover crop growing. They say the weeds that thrive in an area are the weeds that the soil needs most. And that's because if the soil is short in, say, zinc, uh, the plant that's best able to access the zinc that's there is the one that's going to thrive the most. And it's going to accumulate that zinc in its body, and then when it decomposes, it'll make it available to the rest of the plants. So I could have come through, tilled this, imported seed, incorporated the seed, and then cover crop that. But there's tons of organic matter here. I never had to disturb the soil. These plants are more friendly with the natural insects that are in the area. Just leave it as it is. One last step. Annual plants generally have two stages in their life, their vegetative cycle and their reproductive cycle. If you mow a plant when it's in its vegetative cycle, it'll just pop right back and keep growing. But if you wait until they're in their reproductive stage and they're almost ready to have viable seed, and then you mow them, you'll kill them. So that's what I intend to do here. I'm just gonna wait a few days longer and then I'm gonna mow this and the weeds won't come back. There's a ground cover of red clover. I broadcast last fall when the sage and the lemon balm were here. That's coming up really nicely on the bottom. So I can come through, mow all these uh, winter annual weeds and I'll have nothing but red clover left behind. No need to till. So I've mentioned before, labor is the most expensive part of any small scale diversified farm and Weeding is going to be the most expensive part of the labor. This little section, these three rows, I just didn't use them and the weeds have taken over. Uh, to come back through here and weed by hand would be so, so labor intensive. These three rows, uh, I'm going to have to throw them away. It's probably the only section of the farm that didn't get weeded on time. The weeds got out of hand. I'm just going to have to call these three rows a loss rather than sink a ton of time into them. Um, this area here is like the side of a hill and this is the worst soil on the whole farm. Starts kind of in that corner of the farm and kind of comes where the house is and along this ridge. Uh, so I had stuff in here, but it's like, I don't even want to put money and energy into working on this soil. I'm just gonna, we want more trees here too. Like the winds come from this way and it would just be nice if this, so let's just let it go kind of wild. Um, down there is a experiment with um, like no weeding echinacea. Uh, it worked really quite well. There's two different ground covers. On one end, there's micro clover. On the other end, there's dichondra. In the middle, there's both. And um, the idea is like, how can I grow echinacea in like the most wild, uh, like prairie-like conditions possible with the least amount of work? And those things go together nicely. So um, those are on their way. I'm not planting echinacea in rows like this anymore. I'm going to try doing, we actually spread this field out with uh, echinacea before we hate it. And then um, the echinacea seed has to be cold treated. So you have either you can plant it in your flats in like February and just leave it out. Or um, what I did in this case was I put it in like moist soil and just left it in the fridge chuck that out here and then we're going to put the horses on it and the horses are picky grazers they do eat echinacea some but um the idea is i'll put a lot of different medicinal herbs out on the side of this field and let the horses eat mostly the grass and see what herbs we can grow i've herbs growing like that all over the farm and learning which ones you can grow like that and which ones you can't ashwagandha is another important herb from ayurvedic medicine 
It's the root of this crop is what we're after. This plant is related to potatoes and it's uh, susceptible to potato beetle. They do a lot of organic produce out of this valley. There's a lot of potato growers, so there's no way I'm gonna escape potato beetle. What I did here and it worked great this year was I did a trap crop. I planted potatoes in my ashwagandha field and the potato beetle would always go to the potato plant before the ashwagandha. And the spring I could go and crush the potato beetles and their eggs. And then by the time there's really a lot of potato beetles on the potato plants, I just cut the potato plants and put them in a bag to solarize them. And that kept the beetles off of the ashwagandha and concentrated into areas that were really efficient to uh, remove the pests from. Now there's so many potato beetle predators out here, I don't have to worry about the potato beetle being an issue for the rest of the season. Give that another, what are we, all August, all September, hopefully. We have two more months of growing and this will be a, be a considerable amount of root on that plant. You can see this was a transplant. You see how kind of the roots kind of come to here really thick and they, you know, it's just obvious that it wasn't, wasn't done naturally. A lot of times with the root crops, you want to direct seed them. Um, so that way the roots like form very naturally. Uh, but this plant needs like 160 days in our season, or 180 days is it? Our season isn't long enough, so you have to do them from transplants. Um, these brown plants, they're dead now. They're bachelor buttons or corn flowers or beautiful blue flowers when they're in bloom. This is one of the few crops that I'm interested in doing on a 10, 20 or larger acre scale. So my goal is to connect people to sustainable agricultural ecosystems. And that means growing lots of food that's healthy for people. Uh, historically in this area, the Native Americans grew food in these seven sister, uh, three sisters plots where they'd put corn, beans, and squash and a whole lot of other plants all mixed together. And that's what I'm doing here. This field hasn't been any work at all. And look, there's a, I wouldn't say an abundance, but there's plenty of corn, squash, and beans. Um, it wasn't very land efficient in the way I did it, but it was super labor efficient. And we're gonna get a good harvest out of here. This is a beautiful little plot. So are you organic certified? Uh, that's a good question. I am not. Um, no chemicals or synthetic inputs have been used on this farm since 1992, which is part of the reason I, I uh, started farming here. Organic has its place. If you're buying from a giant farm on the other side of the country or the other side of the world, it's important to know that they're not doing these horrendous things like they're doing in some of the non-organic fields but I'm not certified organic for a few reasons. First of all, most people who consume my product, like they know about this place and they know that what I do is so far beyond organic that organic's uh, several steps down. Second of all, it's so backwards that someone who does everything right and doesn't use any chemicals has to pay and do the work of becoming certified, but someone who sprays all the chemicals in the world doesn't have to do any paperwork at all. Um, thirdly, a lot of the organic people, whether on accident or on purpose, uh, cheat. And I'm just not a big fan of third party certification. I'd rather people know where the food came from, where I grew it, right here on my farm. This field is an acre of herbs. We planted it this spring. The planting, the weeding, all that was done with my really slick hand tools. It didn't take that much time. And we're gonna have an abundance, abundance of herbs out here. Last year, we needed to prep this ground. It was in the pasture. It was in basically quack grass. We have to eliminate the quack grass before we start planting. So first we had an Amish neighbor plow it with horses. Um, then we disked in sedan grass seed. That seed got 12 feet tall, taller than these tallest sunflowers. Most people cut the stand grass several times throughout the summer. My goal was maximum weed suppression. So I let it get 12 feet tall, not an ounce of sunlight got to the ground and it totally eliminated the quack grass. I knew I was gonna have a tremendous nitrogen deficiency from all that grass on the surface. So we put down about two inches of uh, barn bedding, straw and manure. And then we dissed that in really well this spring. And then we planted and didn't take that much work. And if you look, I'm so happy with this field. If you look here at the few empty spots, there's just no weeds at all. 
um, which I'm really happy with. There are not hardly any weeds to speak of. A little baby echinacea. This will be flowering next year. Uh, corn. I thought the corn were so sparsely populated that they wouldn't uh, pollinate very well. I can feel there's some missing kernels, but no, this guy is, this guy is not bad, and he's ready to go. Uh, Monarda, those crazy purple flowers we saw before. This is that. I've learned that this plant is very susceptible to powdery mildew. So before I planted them every six inches or every foot, now I've actually have them spaced every several feet. So that way the plants don't touch each other. They get lots of air and they hopefully won't get that powdery mildew. Um, well, these Monarda fill in, I have kale and some different annuals in here. Uh, not an inch of space is wasted. Something's going to grow everywhere. So we're better off having it be my plants rather than weeds. This one's another one of my favorites. We've talked about this, the anisissa. If you look how many bees are on there, I mean, just in this one square foot, there's two bees and that's through the whole length of the field. This is almost ready to harvest. Just now you can see the first petals are starting to fall. Um, I like to let it get a little more than textbook mature. Um, these little side flowers, they're still shooting up. So as it coincides with the full moon, we'll probably harvest this in five, six days. What else do we have here? So this is fragrant hyssop. It does really well here. It's a Mediterranean plant. Um, I love it. This is standard garden sage. Latin name for sage is salvia officinalis, meaning uh, savior, salvia, and officinalis means anything that was in the historical Materia Medica. If you feel this plant and you scrunch it up, it makes your fingers sticky. That's always a sign that compounds are being left behind. And it smells beautiful. My problem is it hasn't overwintered very well. So I think this is the last year I'll be planting standard garden sage and starting next year, I'm gonna use the native wild sage variety that grows around here. Everywhere where we have a miss, we'll put in something. And this is a sunflower. Would you look at that? That, I can hardly get my hand around that trunk. What a beautiful sunflower. If there's no sunlight getting to the ground, no weeds will germinate. And on my scale, the easiest way to suppress weeds is with shade from your living, good growing plants. This is lemon balm. They say lemon balm can't be dried and still retain its quality. Um, I found that to be true with basil, but not with lemon balm. If you go look at lemon balm in like November, December, way after frost, after it's been long dead, and you go smell these dead leaves on the plants, they smell amazing. Um, way better than the stuff you can buy. So that led me to believe that you can dry and process lemon balm very well. But it's not easy. Um, some of the things I've found about it is, first of all, you never know when it's gonna be at its peak maturity. Sometimes this plant in particular, I go out to harvest, I'll load the bins and the knives and the gloves in the truck, and I'll come to harvest lemon balm. The moon will be right, and it'll be in the right stage of growth, and I'll go out and I'll smell it, and just won't be at 100%. And if you start by harvesting it when it's not 100%, it's certainly not gonna be very good when you finish drying it. Also, um, I believe drying this plant at very, very low temperatures, like 85, 90 degrees, and then not over drying it are critical to maintaining the top, top quality. This is catnip. This is the first year I'm growing a lot of catnip. Uh, Amish guys recommended it as something I should grow. They claim it's very sedative, but you can see we already harvested this and how gentle we are in the harvest. We just take the flowering tops of the plants. I'm not trying to take it way down at the base. Now leave all this shade on the ground. The plant keeps growing. So the catnip was starting to infringe on the lemon balm. It was a perfect time to harvest. We cut the flowering tops. Now the lemon balm has room to grow up and fill in that space. You'll see weeds here. Um, that's only because this is a first year planting. What we'll do is when we come through and harvest on our first harvest, we'll uh, pull or execute all these weeds. Actually, a thing we'll do a lot, if you see these are getting close to seed, there's no viable seed in here yet. Um, maybe another week or two before viable seed. So before that, we've got to come through and either pull these plants up or easier yet, once they're in this stage of growth, we can just cut them and leave them there and uh, they've done their job to enrich the soil 
and we've done our job to prevent the seed bank from exploding. I don't have any walkways on the farm. Every inch of ground has to be maintained. Most farms I'll zip through with uh, tillers or something to maintain their walkways. I don't have that. Um, it's easy to not step on the plants you're gonna harvest. I just stay out of here. And then when I do harvest, I start at the beginning, and make sure not to trample and step on the things I haven't harvested yet. So we work up the field always in one direction. You know, there's 14 inches between each plant, so there is plenty of room for your feet. It looks like a solid cover, but there is room at ground level. And then here's just some flowers. I've got so many flowers growing in this field, I don't even know what they all are. Zinnias, uh, columbines, and then probably 20 other flowers I couldn't name. Red clover is an important medicinal herb and I'm particularly interested in it because you can grow it without any weeding. This field, I prepared the soil just like over there with the 12 foot tall sedan grass. And we had a very low weed population to start with. Um, I broadcast red clover seed and oats very early in the spring. The oats grew up and I harvested the milky tops for the teas. And now the red clover are coming in really strong. You might see all these weeds in here. When I come through and harvest this, I have a 16 inch ride weight rake. And it's very tough on the back, but it goes reasonably quick. I'm down ground level with the rake, pulling up the beautiful red clover blossoms. Um, it's critical that I have a weed free stand. And I'm really thrilled with how this is coming along. There are weeds, but they're all the same thing. This is the ragweed. This is the plant that's most responsible for allergies in this part of the country. Um, like I mentioned before, plants have their uh, vegetative cycle and their reproductive cycle. This thing's into its reproductive cycle. I'm gonna wait a little more until all the plants are a little bit bigger, but before viable seed, I'm gonna come down here and mow this pretty low and it'll kill all the annual ragweeds and this red clover Next spring, I'm going to have a tremendous harvest of lush red clover blossoms. Elderberries are an up-and-coming crop. My mentor, Paul, was one of the first guys to put in a few acres of elderberries in this area. They're one of the most nutritious things, uh, highest antioxidant things you can consume. I mostly grow them for elder flowers. I actually contract with three or four farms each year and harvest all the elder flowers off their farm and bring them back here to dry. This is the first substantial planting of elderflowers I have on this farm. And so far, you see these plants are off to a great start. There's been zero weeding. Uh, there's a lot of debate about proper spacing between plants. What I'm doing is 15 feet between rows and six feet between plants. I did that because I can till both directions on the field. It fits really nicely with uh, my neighbor's tractor. And if you look here, there's not a weed to be seen basically. Uh, we get really close to the plants when we come through crosswise with our six foot wide. People say, oh, growing elderberries is easy. It doesn't take any work. Uh, a lot of those people have uh, illusions. I mean, anything. You have to do a really good job on any crop to make it pay. I think it's really important to get your plants, especially the elderberries, off to a really great start. This field, again, was in quackgrass before, and I want to do minimum, minimum tillage. So what we did was one pass with a tiller. Then we threw down oat and pea seed in the spring before the last snow. They got snowed on, they germinated great, but we didn't, you know, with our one tillage on the, the quack grass, all we did was make it mad basically. So we had a nice crop of weeds and oats and peas. And then we came through and uh, started tilling again before we planted the plants really tilled uh, four times, two tillings and two diskings to get this field pretty much dead. Then we planted these things and tilled, excuse me, we tilled the second time uh, crosswise after they were already planted and it got us this nice clean bare field. Now just this week, we had the nice bare field, threw down oat, pea, and radish seed, and then dragged it in. We actually took the drag basically right over these plants as close as we get, and when we hit them, it wasn't a problem. So it kind of came right over the plants with the drag. And you can see now, uh, that's a radish germinating. There's all sorts of, uh, here's a pea germinating. I don't see the oats yet. There we go, there's an oat. So now we've got new cover crop germinating. It's gonna increase organic matter. It's gonna increase fertility with the peas and it's going to uh, winter kill. So we're August 7th now. 
these will all hopefully die of frost before they're able to set viable seed. If they do start to set seed, I'll just mow them. I don't mind if the weeds come and encompass my plants. That's great. It'll provide them a mulch over the winter and it will protect them from the hard freezing conditions out here. Then my rows are 15 feet apart. Um, it's very expensive to rip up land. It's very destructive on the land to, to do all this tillage. So as little as possible. So I'm gonna double crop in here. I'll keep the elderberries going strong uh, with the drip tape. And then between the rows, I'm gonna put my herbs, especially my annual herbs. Um, this section here is actually already planted in corn flour. Then I'm gonna do some sections in California poppy and other sections in Tulsi. And I'll just do all my annual herbs in this field. I started my business with the idea of growing like the absolute best quality herbal teas. And after being here a year, I had a lot of really good herbs uh, produced, processed, and in storage. And I thought, okay, cool, it'll just take me like a couple of days, we'll have some recipes and like we'll be ready for the next step. Oh, I was so wrong. It took me months um, and about 300 iterations to get my flavors just right. So here I've got my tea lab, I call it. Uh, every herb and even some non-herbs, I have maple crystals and apple bits and all sorts of things, a uh, hundredth of a gram scale. And um, anyway, I don't do it every day, but I love playing with here and I have notebooks and notebooks with all these different recipes and like my goddess blend. I've got goddess 1.0, goddess 1.1, 1.2. And every time I taste it, I go, okay, well, I'm gonna do this and this and then uh, make notes. Anyway, blending teas, it's easy to blend a tea, it's pretty good, but to blend one that's like really, really great um, takes quite a lot of work. And then come on down here, I'll see the warehouse. So this is what we've harvested so far this year. We're just, you know, very beginning of August now. Um, and then this is what's left over from last year. Uh, still, even the stuff that's left over from last year is better than anything you're gonna buy because most of the herbs by the time they come into this country, they're already pretty old. Um, and then they come in, they go to a warehouse, they go on a boat, they go to a warehouse, they go to another warehouse, then they end up in a tea bag and that goes to a warehouse and that sits on a shelf. Um, so anything you get from me is gonna be way, way, way fresher than anything that comes imported from around the world. One of my pet peeves is when you order herbs from the big herb companies, they send it to you in a nice Mylar bag, right? With these excellent barrier properties. But those herbs might have been sitting in a big woven poly super sack for three years before they put it in the Mylar bag and shipped it to you. You know, so it's kind of an illusion of this small scale and freshness. Um, also, my lot numbers say the date on them. You know, it's like this chocolate mint, 09, 12, 18. When you get the lot numbers of teas from the big suppliers, it's indecipherable. You have no clue how old those herbs are. And that's no accident. They don't want you to know. If you see, there's like, there's no powder in here. And you see how everything's cut whole length rather than like ground up and shredded. Uh, you can't find California poppy of this quality anywhere. These little calendula flowers, pick these off one at a time. Hey, look at this one. This is a nice bag. Look at how green that is. I just want the very best parts of the very best plants. It's nice in here, it's always cool. Uh, and then I just run a dehumidifier all the time. So these are the three teas I produced this year, Tiger, Angel, and Dream. Uh, Dream is very potently sedative with California poppy as the main ingredient. Angel is delicious, calming and nourishing, really good iced as well as hot. And then Tiger is restorative. It's good for focus and energy. You can drink it in the morning, but also at night to help restore after a long, hard day. These are the teas we have packed up from last year. That's enough inventory to get me through about till Christmas. And then after that, we're gonna come out with new blends of teas using this year's herbs with new packaging. We're always evolving and improving the business. I hope you guys really enjoyed the farm tour and learned a lot. Uh, you guys can do me a huge favor by ordering my teas online for yourself or for gifts and also asking for it at your local stores. On a final note, Sacred Blossom Farm, these herbal teas were, they're a stepping stone for me. My long-term goal is to be the steward of a lot of land and look at the land and from a perspective of what's the best thing for ecology, 
what's the best thing for agriculture and also what's the best thing for residential and tourism and bring those three aspects together on a very large scale project. Um, so maybe in another 10 or 20 years, you'll come back here and see me with uh, thousands of acres work on something like that. Anyway, if you know anyone with a farm or land that can help me get started on that, uh, please put them in touch. Thank you guys so much for visiting the farm. Have a great day. Thank you.